Considered the founder of South Bend, Alexis Cook Willard is interred with his family in All Souls Chapel. Other family members are also buried in Cedar Grove. Alexis served in the War of 1812 under William Henry Harrison and then returned to the St. Joseph Valley, where he became an employee of John Jacob Astor's American Fur Company. He built a trading post on St. Joseph River and in 1824 married Francis Compare. He was the first man to greet Father Soren when he arrived in the area and sent his nephew, also named Alexis, to show Father Soren and the Holy Cross brothers the land that would become Notre Dame. The Coquillards became friends and allies of Father Soren and his young university. He died in a tragic fall in January 1855. Just south of the walkway to All Souls Chapel is a large stone obelisk-shaped marker with a cross on top. This is the grave of Alfred M. Talley. A printer from Chicago, Alfred moved to South Bend in May 1865. Father Soren requested he come to begin publishing Ave Maria, a magazine for Catholic families. The printery eventually became Ave Maria Press and continues to publish Catholic books today. Alfred's red brick house still stands on Juniper Road and is now a historic landmark. Southern by birth, his parents were slave owners, but he was a resolute abolitionist, and his family was rumored to have harbored runaway slaves in their home before the Civil War. One of the earlier graves in Cedar Grove belongs to Pierre Frechette Navarre and is located on the south side of the path to All Souls Chapel. Marked with a plaque on a hewn rock, Pierre, nicknamed Peter, is credited as the first white settler in St. Joseph County. He opened a trading post as an agent of the American Fur Company in 1820, married a Potawatomi woman whose English name was Angelique, and they had six surviving children. The original family cabin has been preserved and moved a short distance from its original location to Lieber Park East in downtown South Bend. Directly off Notre Dame Avenue, next to the Hamas grave, is the grave of Joseph Bertrand, an early settler in the area. The humble stone marker is a replacement of the original. He and his wife Madeline were prominent fur traders and continued the established Catholic kin network. This ensured the traders had safe travel in the region if they could find a connection between their family members and Native American tribes. Godparents of the baptized were considered family, and Madeline was often a baptismal sponsor, and her children were godparents for many Native American converts. Joseph helped the Potawatomi as part of the resistance to the U.S. government's seizure of their land and helped negotiate treaties that prohibited the forced removal of Catholic Native Americans. Madeline's maiden name was Levarchec Chevalier. She descended from the Alini tribe and is said to be buried in the Indian burial mound now located in the far southwest area of Section D. Next to Joseph Bertrand's grave, directly off Notre Dame Avenue, is Romy and Dorothy Hamas's grave. It's marked by a stone bench with a beautiful Madonna and Child plaque in the Della Robbia style in the center. Generous contributors to Notre Dame, you'll recognize their name on the bookstore dedicated in 1955, but they also supported Catholic causes around the world and received the honor of Knight of St. Gregory by Pope Pius XII for their service to the church. In Section A, near the center east-west path, rests Larry Moon Mullins and his wife Mary. Moon came to Notre Dame from South Pasadena and played fullback for Newt Rockne from 1928 to 1930. His second two seasons, the team won consecutive national championships and finished with perfect untied and undefeated records. In 1931, Larry had lunch on campus with Rockne right before the coach left on his fateful trip. He was one of six team members to carry Newt Rockney's casket to his grave. Moon Mullins spent the rest of his life coaching college football. In the southeast area of Section D, small flat stones mark the graves of Joseph Casasanta and his wife Anita. Visiting his grave, your mind may begin playing verses of beloved Notre Dame songs, because Joseph was director of Notre Dame bands for 19 years, beginning in 1923. Also chair of the music department and glee club director, he composed the music for Hike Notre Dame, When Irish Backs Go Marching By, and Notre Dame Our Mother, which he composed for Newt Rockne's funeral in 1931. 
While he didn't write the Notre Dame Victory March, he did provide the first score from Marching Band, as well as the 1932 published arrangement currently performed by the Notre Dame Band. Professor Joseph J. Casasanta died on December 1, 1968. Engraved on a cleanly designed granite memorial stone in Section D is a quote from the book God for Us. The grave belongs to the book's author, Catherine Maury Lacugna, a popular and generous theology professor at Notre Dame who was taken from this earthly world by cancer at the age of 44. Her work focused on the practical implications of the doctrine of the Trinity for the life of the Church. She received two of the university's most prestigious awards, the Frank O'Malley Undergraduate Teaching Award and the Reverend Charles E. Sheedy CSC Award for Excellence in Teaching. Despite being extremely weak, she taught her last class of the semester on April 29, 1997, and then died four days later. In the western side of Section D, in a grave with a small Celtic cross on the stone, rest two high school sweethearts, Leon Hart and his wife Lois. In 1949, Leon won the Heisman Trophy and the Maxwell Award while at Notre Dame, and went on to play eight seasons with the Detroit Lions. He holds the distinction of being the only lineman to win three national titles in college and three NFL championships. And he's one of only two linemen ever to win the Heisman. With a degree in mechanical engineering, Leon went into business, operating a company that manufactured equipment to balance tires. He successfully campaigned to have NFL pension benefits retroactively applied to those who played before 1959. Though financially comfortable himself, he fought for his teammates who needed those benefits. In row 12 of Section E, you'll find the grave of Moose Krause and his wife Elise Elizabeth with their photos engraved on the stone. Born in Chicago to Lithuanian parents, Edward Walter Kriauchunas had his surname shortened to Krause by his high school football coach who couldn't pronounce the family name. At Notre Dame, Moose competed in track, baseball, football, and basketball, becoming the first Notre Dame player to make the Hall of Fame in both basketball and football. After graduating cum laude in 1934 with a journalism degree, he began a long career in athletics. At Notre Dame, he served as both assistant football coach and head basketball coach. And while filling in for an ailing Frank Leahy, Moose's record was 3-0. He served in the Marines during World War II, including a 14-month stretch as an air combat intelligence officer in the South Pacific. In 1949, when Leahy stepped down as athletic director to focus on his post as head football coach, Moose Krause took over. He served in that role until 1981. At the south end of Section G, you'll find the grave of Notre Dame football star Joseph Boland, marked by a stone bench with a sundial perched on one end. A 1927 graduate who played for Newt Rockney, Joe came from Philadelphia and was a big man for that era, weighing 216 pounds. Few people know that his playing career ended on the field in October 1926 in a game against Minnesota. He collided with his teammate and boyhood friend, Joe Maxwell, and severely broke his leg. Boland went on to coach, eventually returning to Notre Dame to work under Elmer Layden, but later left to pursue a broadcasting career. He established the Irish Football Network, becoming the first voice of Notre Dame, as well as calling the Chicago Cardinals games of the NFL. His wife, Margaret, was laid to rest with him in 1966, six years after his death. You may recognize the small statue on the gravesite of famed football coach Ara Parsegian in Section K. It's similar to the large-scale version that stands outside the southeast side of Notre Dame Stadium. A native of Akron, Ohio, he played halfback for the Cleveland Browns for two years until a hip injury sent him into coaching. He led the Fighting Irish from 1964 to 1974 with two national championships. But his toughest opponent was the rare disease Neiman Pick Type C that took the lives of his three grandchildren. With no cure available, Parsegian established a medical foundation to find one. He and his family worked tirelessly to raise millions of dollars in the hope of sparing more families that heartache, and the foundation continues its quest today.
Marked by a polished stone engraved with the Notre Dame monogram and the Golden Dome, George Kelly's grave is in Section J. Buried with his wife Gloria, he was a dedicated fixture in the athletic department for 34 years, half of them as an assistant to coaches Ara Parsegian, Dan Devine, and Jerry Faust. He came to Notre Dame as a football prospect from Rockford, Illinois, but injury shortened his career, and he turned to coaching immediately after graduation. After coaching around the country, Ara Parsegian invited him back to his alma mater in 1968 to become a linebacker's coach. He never left. During George Kelly's tenure, the Irish defense ranked among the nation's top 10 six times, including 1974, when the team ranked first. Southeast of the Mausolea is the grave of Regis Philbin, the beloved television host who set the Guinness World Record for the most hours on U.S. television. While a student at Notre Dame, he played on the tennis team. And after his graduation in 1953, he often returned to campus for football games, concerts, pep rallies, and other celebrations. He donated funds to build the Philbin Studio Theater, an experimental black box theater located in the DeBartolo Performing Arts Center. He was also known for hosting local philanthropic events, such as the fundraisers for the Center for the Homeless and scholarship nights for the Moose Kraus chapter of the College Football Hall of Fame. Just southeast of the mausoleum complex, you'll find the simple flat markers for Dominic Nappi Napolitano and his wife Mary. Nappi came to Notre Dame from New York and boxed as a featherweight in the program Newt Rockney began. He fell in love with the campus and practically never left again. In 1931, he organized the Bengal Bouts so the students could box in a tournament to raise money for the Holy Cross missions in East Bengal, now Bangladesh. That first tournament raised $500, but boxers since have raised over $1 million for the missions. Nappi died a few weeks later after the finals night of the 1986 Bengal bouts. Flanked by all the boxers, Nappi's family and hundreds of friends, fellow coaches and university officials, Father Ned Joyce gave the eulogy at Sacred Heart Church. Notre Dame football great Charles Sweeney Sr. and his wife Helen are buried in Section K in a grave marked by a statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary surrounded by a rosary. Chuck was a consensus first-team All-American and the leading vote-getter in the country for the 1938 college All-Star team. He joined the Green Bay Packers after college, but shortly after moved on to become an official for the NFL. He continued for 25 years and was one of eight officials to work the historic first Sudden Death Championship between the New York Giants and the Baltimore Colts in Yankee Stadium in 1958. The grave of Constance and Ralph McInerney and their young son Michael is in Section K of the cemetery. Ralph joined the Notre Dame faculty in 1955, becoming one of its most affectionately regarded and respected members for 53 years before retiring. An internationally renowned scholar who specialized in the work of St. Thomas Aquinas, he wrote some two dozen scholarly books and hundreds of essays on medieval philosophy, ethics, and the philosophy of religion. He also wrote poetry and more than 80 novels, some of them murder mysteries set on the Notre Dame campus. Well known for writing the Father Dowling Mysteries, the series was adapted for television in 1989, but the author steadfastly refused to watch it. In the Mary, Queen of All Saints mausoleum rests a Notre Dame figure legendary not for athletics, but for academics. Emil T. Hoffman taught chemistry to more than half of each freshman class from 1950 to 1990, counting more than 32,000 graduates as former students. A native of Patterson, New Jersey, he grew up during the Great Depression and chose chemistry as his field because the two men who bought the most expensive pies at his father's bakery were chemists. On campus in the 1970s, he led the effort to integrate women into the student body and served as the first dean of the freshman year of studies. He exerted total authority over his oversized classes, but made it clear he cared about each individual and wanted each to succeed. His rigorous seven-question Friday quizzes became famous, forcing half the freshman class to stay in and study every Thursday night for decades. 
In section D of the cemetery, look for the grave where Arthur Eric Haas and his wife Emma are laid to rest. Interestingly, the memorial is engraved with twin crosses, though Arthur came from a Jewish family in Czechoslovakia. He was a well-known theoretical physicist who emigrated to the U.S. from Austria in 1935 and then accepted, upon recommendation of Albert Einstein, a faculty position at Notre Dame. Known as one of the founders of quantum mechanics, in 1938 he organized the first International Conference of Cosmology, which was held at Notre Dame. His standard text of physics was published in 10 languages. In Section B, near Holy Cross Drive, is the grave of Joseph Kernan III, former governor of Indiana. A native of Chicago, Joe graduated from Notre Dame in 1968 and joined the Navy. As a naval aviator, he was shot down in North Vietnam in 1972 and was a prisoner of war for nearly a year. He received the Distinguished Flying Cross, two Purple Hearts, and the Navy Commendation Medal. He became the mayor of South Bend in 1988, serving nine years, then lieutenant governor of Indiana, and eventually governor in 2003. Following his career in politics, he served as the president and managing investor of the South Bend Silver Hawks baseball team, and as an adjunct professor at the university.